We are live. Welcome to 1992's Fortress Review and Thoughts film. I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I realize this video is long, and I'll do what I can to make it worth your time. I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Now, let's see. So, I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will warn verbally before I do so, and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. Now, content warning and trigger warning. I'm afraid I have a hard time understanding the distinction, but I do really respect how necessary the terms are, and I want to cover my bases. I am going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie, including torture, kidnapping, ableism, gaslighting, mental illness, xenophobia, murder, body horror, the powerful abusing their power, and rape. And the MPAA rated the this an R, and the video will be for those... Yeah, will also be R-rated. Also, please note that I have a tendency to sometimes, when I'm discussing a sensitive subject, use descriptive terms that I consider neutral that other people consider negative. So if I say something that sounds judgmental, it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive and not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Now, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. And when I first watched this, it was fairly new, so I'm not going to be judging it based on, like, you know, when I first watched it, the effects, for example, look 100% convincing to me. So, yeah. Now, let's see. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say, during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now... I base this version on the, it's, it's either the US R-rated version or the unrated version. And yeah, you know, if you have, if you at all have a choice, get as uncut a version of the movie as at all possible. I have watched this movie dozens of times. I couldn't tell you if it's 24 times, 36 times, but yeah. Now, let's see, I I think I probably watched it maybe around 1999 or, yeah, somewhere around that time. This is one of those movies that the first time I watched it was a number of years ago. I've watched it a bunch of times. I, I used to have, let's see, I used to have a VHS copy and... <laughs> I do still have a VCR, but the, yeah, I have a DVD copy of it. Now, anyway, yeah, back when, when I, I have no idea where my VHS copy of the movie is anymore. Back when I knew where it was, I watched it many, many times. I, I probably only, maybe two or three years I had it, and I just watched it over and over for those years. It really made a strong impression on me right from the very first time. And honestly, on, on this rewatch, most things in the movie, like, I couldn't necessarily have told you what was going to happen very long before it did happen, but, like, 
ultimately, I'm not sure I would say that I really forgot anything about the movie. It was just memories that I hadn't accessed in a long time. But, like, there wasn't anything in this movie where I was like, that's in there? Like, where, where I just completely didn't remember. Anyway, I've been wanting to talk about it on camera for a very long time. You know, for... Let's see. Yeah, for many years I did not have access to the movie, now I have access to it again. That's why I'm doing the video on it now. Otherwise, I would have done it years ago. Like, I started making videos near the end of the of, of 2009. Even back then, I was incredibly passionate about this movie. And it's, it's honestly, it's hard for me to overstate how much fun it was to watch this movie again. How glad I am that I own the DVD and, you know, to now be talking about it on camera. This is... Yeah, the, the kind of elation I feel when I watch this movie is, yeah, that's why we watch movies, you know, like, instant. yeah. And the most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video, so, well, I had lunch in between, so that it would be fresh in my mind. I'm not 100% certain when this movie is set. The DVD says the year 2012. Online, some places said 2017, some said 2023, some said after 2023. It the, the movie is set sometime in the future, you know, the movie's from 1993. It was set in what would be the relatively not too distant future. In the in this movie's universe, even minor crimes are punished incredibly harshly. Christopher Lambert plays our lead, John Henry Brennick, and he and his wife, Karen B. Brennick, she, she really B. Brennick, are put in prison because he impregnated her with a second child. It is simply illegal to have more than one child. Now, you might be thinking, they should have known better. Why isn't one child enough? The thing is, their first child died in childbirth, so, you know, this... It's not as much, yeah, this is essentially their only child, but, you know, they're in prison because of a technicality. And I know some people say the movie has a plot hole and that why is it illegal to become pregnant a second time if the first pregnancy doesn't lead to a living child? There's tons of laws in real life that don't make sense and don't take circumstances into account. Steve Hofstetter was once confronted by a cop about not having a place to sleep right after he told the cop there was a murder at his hotel. It's okay. He made it funny. They're taken to an underground prison called Fortress, far out in the desert. And, you know, it can be only... Yeah, the prison can only be reached by a retractable bridge with incredibly harsh conditions, and neither of them have a map of the area tattooed in code on their back. Can they possibly escape? And it's also worth noting, it is like really far below, like, the 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 surface of the Earth, you know, it's... Did, did they... I think they said that it was 33 stories further down than that, so, yeah, it's... It's gonna be incredibly difficult, but, of course, they're gonna try, and that's where... You know, that's where the fun begins. So, this is an action crime sci-fi thriller with fun and exciting action. The, the thrill aspects are scary at times, and the sci-fi does stimulate your brain. It is soft sci-fi. I think there are might be times where it thinks that it's hard sci-fi, but anyway. I, I have to admit, I was a little bit surprised that horror was not one of the genres listed on IMDb for this. I personally would say there are elements of this that are horror. But yeah, it was released in... Oh, did I say 1993? I meant... Wait. I'm pretty sure it's... 1992. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. I th yeah, I think it's that in some countries it only came out in 1993. Anyway. 1992, directed by Stuart Gordon, R.I.P. And... Thematically, it's exploring imprisonment and what is deemed criminal. The prison is seen to discourage hope for a future, even dreams are illegal, so we're into thought crime. 
And it treats you equally badly whether you try to have a second kid or whether you murder someone. And, you know, there are no consequences for people working for and at the prison. No one cares how badly you treat convicts. And it explores private prisons where, like, the, the prisoners are literally owned by the corporation Mentel that runs the, the prison. And, yeah, you have forced labor, budget cuts, and, let's see, yeah, and uh, quoting a fellow critic, overpopulation, alarming slash scary development of technology, and it is not as satiric or intelligent as Paul Verhoeven's Robocop, for instance, but still it is... It is a little more than just an average blastem action film set in the future. I don't know of any other movie that has the, you know, yeah, this exact concept. I know of some that have somewhat similar, and I do definitely think that this movie was well worth making. Now... I realize a lot of people think very little of this movie, and I, I myself will be criticizing aspects of it, but I do kind of love this movie. I, I did when I was younger, and I still do. I hope I don't come off as an apologist. I'm not interested in being an apologist, but I do think that this is one of those movies that are criticized unfairly, and so I try to stand up for it. Now... Some people say that the movie is style over substance. For sure, like, it has, it, it goes into a lot of ideas, but it doesn't dig deep into very many of them. I, I think you could make an argument that the movie does explore the, the treatment of prisoners. But other than that, most of the ideas are only seen fairly briefly in the movie. You know, once again, like, Robocop is, goes much, much deeper in exploring the ideas that it explores. And I, I am doing videos on the Robocop trilogy down the line. Now, IMDb's More Like This list compares this to a bunch of movies that I don't know anything about, but also Fortress 2 Reentry, the, the sequel to this, and I... I rated that a 5 out of 10, but it's been a long time. I It's possible I would rate it lower today, or possibly slightly higher. And No Escape, which back then I gave it a 6 out of 10. I, I think today it would probably be a, a 7 out of 10. And for sure, like, both are about prisons that are difficult to escape from, that you wouldn't want your worst enemy to go to. And that movie does also have one of my favorite lines of all time. You've got a terrible case of nobody tells me what to do. And for some, like, Resurrection is listed by IMDb. It's more like, I mean, they both star Christopher Lambert. I'm not sure I can think of any other, I, I guess some, the, the, is Resurrection also kind of edgy maybe? Other than that. Now, Fortress 2 does have some good ideas, but it really lacks the edge that this movie has. I think that movie might also be R-rated, though, so I don't... It's it's probably just that the, like, the studio didn't want to risk making a movie that was so dark that it was really difficult to sell. And it just... Yeah. A big part of the appeal of this movie is... The Edge. And... Yeah, so... I decided to review this movie because, you know, I remembered really loving the movie, and I figured I probably still would, and... Yeah, I, I still do. Hypothetically, if I hadn't watched this before, and I first watched it today, I probably wouldn't love it as much. I would probably still love it. 
When I was a jaded teenager during the late 90s and early to mid 2000s, I loved watching edgy dark movies from the 80s and 90s that fall into one or more of the following genres. Action, thriller, sci-fi, horror. And this has elements of all four genres. And that, that's why I watched it back then. That's why I loved it back then. That's why I love it now. And so let's see. Yeah, subgenres, comic book, prison drama. Others say, I honestly, like, I don't know very many prison dramas. Like, as, as far as I can tell, I, th I think the only other prison dramas I'm familiar with are Shawshank Redemption. Pris Does Prison Break count? You know, originally, the, you know, before they made the second movie, they were going to make a follow-up in the form of a TV show. I could see a happy marriage of Prison Break and Fortress. Watching them plan and attempt a prison break in this super high-tech futuristic prison with just a million different things that they have to deal with along the way is just so much fun. Like, when you first... When you... Yeah, when you watch the movie... Yeah, the, the first time you watch the movie, you really don't know how they're going to deal with all of these different... You know, yeah. There's the retractable bridge, the 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 fact that they're so far down below the, the Earth's surface, all of the futuristic security, like, yeah, the, the, the ways that they administer, you know, physical discipline, and the fact that it's really far out in the desert, like, there's so many different yeah and actually I, I saw some people say that it reminded them of like Erewhon and yeah for for sure there's there's a lot of yeah if 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 Erewhon was a movie instead of a few scenes it would be a, a decent uh, like rival of of this movie I don't think I mean, now that I've set Erewhon, if you remember the movie, you'll know what movie I'm talking about. But if I haven't, if, if you haven't already watched the movie, I don't know that I would want to give away Erewhon. So I'm not going to say what movie it is, but yeah, you know, if you've watched it a lot of times, you probably do remember the, the movie itself that's, yeah. Now, I do think that the idea that you can only have one child in this movie's world would have hit harder if they brought race into it. Like, if the protagonists were not white, and that's why they weren't allowed to have children, or only one, you know, while white people were allowed to have multiple children. You know, there's this Latino prisoner that called, called Nino. You know, they could maybe have him explain that he and other non-whites are not allowed to have any children at all. You know, in reality, the American government has had a number of undesirables sterilized without their consent. And, yeah, I, I think, sadly, the reason that they don't bring race into it is that there would be a chunk of the audience, the American audience watching this movie, that would be like, well, yeah, we gotta be careful that they don't outbreed us. Now, the... Let's see the the yeah so in this movie the the instead of guards with batons they have the the so-called intestinator and basically yeah I just have to I have to very briefly express that the 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 word intestinator and they they there's a verb the the noun is intestinator that is the the specific little, it's its like a little metal ball, but it, you know, carefully programmed by, you know, and accessible by Wi-Fi, I guess, through a computer. And it can, it can cause severe pain in your stomach. So, you know, essentially 
a very similar effect to having guards with batons, because they will very frequently aim for the solar plexus, so the, the middle of the stomach. And, yeah, so noun, intestinator, verb, intestinate, which means using it to, you know, to, to cause a lot of pain in, in your stomach. And I saw someone point out that intestinator and intestinate making those words in, instead of like, you know, in, in real life, you would have like a boring name as, a, yeah, maybe electronic baton or something is what they would, you know, intestinator and intestinate sound like words that come out of like a, a comic book. And I just want to say, I absolutely love that. That's perfect. And it's actually, it's forced into cons via the mouth. So it, it looks like oral rape and it's shown on a man. So it is, yeah, the movie likes to push your buttons. And I saw someone, uh, one, one critic said that the intestinator is a low budget, you know, lo low budget bear trap. I like to think of it more as a reverse bear trap, which is extremely useful for catching the very elusive reverse bear. And John and Karen were apparently trying to cross the border into Canada because, you know, it's, it's U.S. law that you can't have more than one ch child. So, yeah, you know, going to Canada, that's a good way to escape the, the you know, escape America when you think about it. And let's see. So the... Just going to go here. Yeah, so I am going to briefly quote a critic and respond to his arguments. The story is set in an America where abortion has been outlawed, but a one child policy has also ensured that women who get pregnant twice are jailed, given that ridiculous laws ensuring lengthy prison terms for people who sell small, harmless quantities of drugs are already seeing our prisons full to bursting point, this entire scenario is laughable at best. Laws attempting to stem the tide of reproduction have been tried before and all of them have failed. Sometimes, as has been seen in China, they fail with disastrous side effects. I am almost 100%... Okay, so that was the critic. Now my commentary. I'm almost 100% certain that those are points the movie is making. I'm not saying it's the smartest movie ever made or anything, but I think they are saying that it is important to be wary of governments imprisoning masses of people over something that isn't that harmful. They go with pregnancy instead of drug possession because a lot of Americans, especially in the early 90s, still thought that the war on drugs was a good thing, but they are arguing against the war on drugs. Obviously, this is a version of America where there are way more private prisons than there are now, or possibly you have to do worse crimes involving drugs than possession to end up in prison. And they intentionally choose something like pregnancy in part because China is a dictatorship that imposes something like that. And most people don't think that you should make it illegal to procreate. You know, when, again, if they just said, you know, look at how bad a prison you have to go into just for, you know, what's it called again? Possession. You know, there would be a chunk of the audience who would be like, well, you know, as long as it gets the drugs off the streets. You know, they're actually, like, some people think that this movie goes too far and is too extreme, but I've literally, literally, I don't mean figuratively, literally, I have, I have read reviews of this movie that said that prison doesn't seem that bad. So, I think they have a reason to, to go kind of extreme with, with how, like, yeah. Let me, let me make absolutely no bones about it. I hope this kind of, the, a prison even a tenth as bad as the one we see in this movie, I would hope never comes to exist, and certainly if they do, I hope they are shut down and replaced with far more humane ones. Now, the, the writing. This script was written by four people, and, you know, some people joke, it took four people to write this. Heh. <laughs> the fact that four people, you should not have very many writers on, on one thing. It, it, it's not always 
a recipe for disaster, but it very frequently is. It means that different people had very different ideas and that the final product might be this just horrible stew of very different ideas that really do not, you know, go together. Honestly, I think that the different people just had different ideas for how the prison could be extreme. It, it doesn't really feel that much like a product of being written by very many different people. It, every idea does feel like it fits within. There's, I, I, I can't really point to any one idea in this movie that feels completely out of step with the rest of the movie. But yeah, this was written by Troy Neighbors, who, let's see, yeah, Troy Neighbors, Steven Feinberg, David Venable, and Terry Curtis Fox. And the, let's see, apparently I haven't seen anything else that they've written. Troy Neighbors and Steven Feinberg are also credited for Fortress 2, but only Oh, no, never mind. I was going to say only characters. No, they also wrote the story for Fortress 2. And, yeah, that doesn't surprise me, I have to admit. The the writers being, some of the writers being some of the same people for the second one, I, I could see that. I, I don't think it's as much a writing issue. I, I think it's that, like, at at one point a producer came in and was like, this is way too edgy. This is way too dark. There's going to be a lot of theaters that are not going to show this. There's going to be parts of America that aren't going to want to sell the DVD. We have to tone it down. And in doing so, they really, like, the second movie is such a watered-down version of this. Anyway. So, the... I think the writing does a good job of bringing up these interesting ideas, but then, yeah, not not really exploring them too deeply. That you know, it it would be really great if it explored them more deeply. I th I think a better version, like hypothetically, a better version of this movie exists somewhere out in the multiverse where a producer was like, you have good ideas, but we can't explore all of those ideas in a single 90-minute movie, so you're going to have to trim a few of them and then spend the time that would have gone to those ideas on exploring the other ideas, and that will, you know, overall the movie would be better, but, you know, if you're like 13 and you watch this, it might seem like one of the best movies ever made. So... And I, th I think that ultimately it was made for, you know, edgelord teenagers who really wanted to see something like, yeah, fa fairly extreme that, yeah. It handles plot twists quite well. There are not too many. They're not bad. There aren't too few. They're not too easy to figure out. It's not one of those movies that works until you learn the twist and then it completely falls apart. Even on the first viewing, it is not difficult to keep up with the twists. I would love to see something similar to this directed by Stuart Gordon. I haven't watched I realize that's not going to happen today since, unfortunately, he's passed away. But I will have to look more at, at his... Um, the, the other stuff that he's directed, I, yeah, I haven't watched all of it. Now, that's right, I actually, this is the only movie he's directed that I've watched. I've watched movies that he's written, including The Dentist, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Let's see. Oh, he only wrote the characters for Honey, I Blew Up the Kid. Okay. Anyway. I watched that entire trilogy and a chunk of the TV show. That concept just does make a lot, make, make a ton of sense as a TV show. Who doesn't want to see episode after episode 
I don't even remember the, the character's name, but Rick Moranis' character inventing various sci-fi technologies and then them having fun with it. That was a fun show. I, I think I'm going to see if I can't find that somewhere. Anyway. Yeah, he's... he's the, the movies that he's most well-known for, other than Fortress, are The Pit and the Pendulum, Robot Jocks, Dolls, From Beyond, and, of course, Reanimator. And I know, I know. I'm a fan of Stuart Gordon, I'm a fan of Jeffrey Combs, and I haven't watched Reanimator. I will eventually get to it, I swear. There's, there's I've, I've watched... Diaz Deacon's reviews of the Reanimator movies and of From Beyond. I have to watch those movies. They look amazing. That yeah. But yeah, I would definitely say that Stuart Gordon really understood the 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 concept. It doesn't feel like he's like awkwardly struggling against. No, he he got it and he did what he could to really make the best movie out of it. Now. The, the the movie, let's see, Stuart Gordon's career went on for years after this movie. Some do say that this was his last great film, and some say that it's not great. And after, a, a lot of people said that he hasn't made a good movie after this one. And I can't comment on that. I can't say if he, if he did or did not do so. But, you know, sadly... So, some, you know, not all directors are, not all creative, not all people who work in fields of creative expression are able to, like, go out on a really high note, sadly. Now, yeah, I am always down for Jeffrey Combs playing roles in sci-fi and horror. This is the part of the video where I usually describe the, the opening shot. I'm going to go ahead and quote a fellow critic here because he does such a great job. The opening shot alone of a bleak dystopian future really sets the tone for the movie. It shows some bums in an alleyway, then the camera slowly zooms up to show a futuristic soldier overlooking the street, and then the camera pans up a bit more to show we are at a U.S. border crossing, and the good guys are trying to leave the country. A nice progression of subtle steps, and that's pretty much all the backstory we get, and really all that we need. World building doesn't need exposition when it's done this well, and it's absolutely true. Like, it, right away, you get a really strong sense of just how dystopian this future is. It's it's chilling. Now, let's see. The, yeah, and the, the opening titles have this really ominous music. I, I saw at least some people criticizing the music. I really don't understand. I, I think it's completely perfect for the, the tone of the movie. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but I will say, with no spoilers, it fits with what came before. I am extremely happy with how the movie ends. There's no Deus Ex Machina, there's no convenient writing, and, you know, like, the first time I watched this, I didn't think they were going to have... I, I didn't I didn't see how they were gonna be able to have a satisfying ending, but they do. It's it's very impressive. The ending resolves everything. You understand why it happens the way it does, why it couldn't have happened sooner. Now and the ending titles are also really great. The there's this really overpowering effect and just yeah, and, and it fits the emotion of the ending really, really well. Now, let's see. The movie never lost my interest. You know, the, the I wouldn't really say that there were any parts of it that just felt like, okay, I guess we have to, we just have to suffer through this to get to more. I, I'm aware that other people think that there are parts I, I I don't see it like I, I was reading reviews 
And I was like, oh, wow, maybe maybe it's not as good as I remember. And then I watched it and it's like, what are the what movie were these people watching? I just I don't get it at all. Anyway, moving on to the characters now. The Karen could be a lot more interesting and essentially like I know strong female character is kind of like you know some people think that I'm not saying every single movie ever made needs to have a strong female character there are some that don't but I will grant that there are aspects of Karen where it's like, you know, you're, you're really... She's not completely not a strong female character, but it is one of those movies where, like, if a woman is doing something cool, it's kind of because she's in a situation that the guys aren't. Like... A guy would be doing this if only he could get the chance to but he can't so the woman will have to but she does do it you know she does manage to do some things that yeah I really appreciate like the movie could very easily Karen could very easily just have been there for sex appeal and then as someone that John has to rescue and that is you know, the movie does get that out of her character, but it's not the only thing that her character is there for. Now, for a number of the prisoners, you don't really know that much about them. And, you know, that this is a movie that some people aren't going to be able to get that much into because of how little we know about the prisoners. Like, they are essentially they're they're archetypes more than people and like they have just minimal definition and i understand why some you know for sure there are people out there who think that that's that doesn't work i disagree i think it works i i cared about every single if, if every character in this movie that has a name, I care about when I watch the movie. And there are characters that are hard to like. And yeah, like the, there's, there's, um, for sure there are some characters in this that by the end of the movie, some viewers still won't care about because they've done too many awful things. I agree that they've done. Like, we shouldn't be able to care about them, but somehow I manage to, to care about them. And, you know, the, the... I haven't shown this movie to very many people, but the people I've shown it to also really liked, really cared about all the characters. Like... A couple of them, it's you can't really use the word like. It doesn't make sense to say that you like that character. But you don't wish that the movie just didn't have that character. Or that the movie never asked us to at least have some sympathy or empathy for that character. Now, let's see. Yeah, and I, I would say that, you know, given that the movie you know, presents these characters that are hard to like and gives them moments where their humanity shines through, I would say that the idea, you know, it's done on purpose, the idea is to make the viewer empathize with convict, convict with nuclear vessels when a lot of people don't really think about people who are in prison. And that is kind of like... If, if the movie wants to say any one thing, it is that we should be wary of how prisoners are treated and what, you know, what things are crimes. What, what is criminal? What can you go to prison for? 
And, you know, in 1993, prisons did not look anywhere near, anywhere near as bad as, you know, Fortress. But it was still already very bad, and, yeah, you know, they, they wanted to start a conversation. And, yeah, the, the, you feel a lot of empathy for John and Karen. And some of the villains, you really, like, you feel a deep, searing hatred for. Like, you, you, just so, so awful. You just, you despise them, and, yeah, the movie does a really good job at that. Like, I've seen a lot of movies where it's like, okay, I, I get that I'm supposed to care about these, but it's just, and I'm not really, and I get that, that guy is definitely supposed to be like, oh, worst person ever. You know, but this one gets it. Now, I already mentioned that John's full name is John Henry Brennick. John Henry is an American folk hero. And actually, in african-american so again they did anyway he is said to have worked as a steel driving man a man tasked with hammering a steel drill into rock to make holes for explosives to blast the rock into in constructing a railroad tunnel and yeah john henry fought the machine and won though died right after due to stress so <laughs> the movie's not subtle the movie is about as subtle as a jackhammer, actually. Yeah, they they literally... And, and, like, if you haven't watched the movie, you might be like, well, he's not... He's. It doesn't sound like John in this movie is, like, you know, hammering a steel drill into rock. They actually, like, all of the... Uh, all? I, th I think all... I think, ev as far as I understand, every bit, yeah, all of the, the prisoners in this prison, or it, it, any who aren't pregnant, are actually tasked with digging further into the ground to make the prison even bigger so that even more people can be put in the prison. And I, that, that's again where, like, hypothetically, they could have said, oh, we're going to make, like, a really tall building and make that a prison, you know, so that if you're really high up, you can't just jump out because you'll die from the impact. But they chose to make it that they, they dig deep into the ground. And I really think that the idea is because they're digging into the ground, it is like, you know, they're digging a bigger, a bigger hole for themselves. You know, this thing is going to fail eventually, but they won't admit it. They just keep refusing to admit it, and they dig and dig. And the, the, and, and the fact that it's out in the desert, it, it points to the fact that a lot of prisoners, like, sadly, and this is some, this is sadly something that a lot of movies are kind of, guilty of encouraging for a lot of people once someone is a prisoner people don't really think about what like i'm like i get the idea of like saying well if they did something wrong there has to be consequences but a lot of people don't look at recidivism rates and think like ah let me think i i there, there are different kinds of justice. There is punitive justice, and yeah, you know, that just means you, you hurt someone else, so we're going to hurt you real bad. So you'll learn not to hurt other people. And then there's restorative justice. And this movie shows a prison with no restorative justice. There is no sense that they are making... That they're not making amends, they're just serving their time and making the prison bigger because the people in charge are certain that more people are going to end up in the prison. Like, 
ideally, if you run a prison, you would want to make sure that you you would you would want people who aren't in prison to you know to to never be tempted to do something that would send them to prison and you would want people already in prison to leave prison capable of of like having a a life like going out there getting a job working and you know but they they really they they don't and i'm not saying that you know there there are sadly there are almost definitely some totalitarian countries that have prisons that are as callous that care as little about the the well-being and lives of their inmates and that's basically you know the movie is trying to to shock you like the movie is basically trying to shock fence sitters into either thinking that we need more and bigger prisons or that we need to change the the change the system so that a number of the things that are currently treated as really significant crimes that lead to long sentences of doing really hard time you know let's let's actually look at does it work do they leave the prison a better person or are we just saying well they did something wrong so we're gonna hurt them real bad and then you know they leave the prison and they're you know they they like if a prisoner leave if if an ex-con is is completely unable to get a job what are they supposed to do for food or are we just supposed to expect them to lie down and die of starvation if they can't get a job then they uh, yeah I, yeah i think i've made my point the the and again i'm not saying like if if the for sure there are situations where you you need to you need to make it you need to to make a a strong impression on someone you need to make them realize what you did was wrong you can't do that again that is unacceptable but i would say it's pretty clear with how packed prisons are in america that that's not what's happening right now there are not enough like a, a lot of people have such a difficult time avoiding all the things that have been made crimes that they end up in prison at some point and very many people like the the recidivism rates are ridiculous like a lot of people who have been put in prison at least for a short time leave prison not not better at avoiding crimes just having a harder time getting and holding a job Christopher Lambert as John Henry Brennick the the he's he's not that great of an actor and it is this kind of thing of I think there 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 was maybe I I heard that he was good in what's it called Grace Stroke or something where he apparently played Tarzan and I I could see that. I think if if I had to guess, I would say that the best acting he can do is nonverbal and that some people think that sounds like an insult. I think the nonverbal acting that Arnold Schwarzenegger does in the first Terminator movie is incredible. If if you actually like do a do a test. You don't have to show it to anyone, but just like get your phone, film yourself doing nonverbal acting, and then watch it back and see how difficult it actually is. It is the the we are we are by our nature, we want to communicate and we want to 
socialize and that you know for some people that's very difficult but it there is a there is a drive towards that so nonverbal acting is actually very very difficult i don't really get the sense that like he just th there are some there are some things that work against christopher lambert as an actor but what he very frequently is, is very entertaining to watch. I think if, if, if there was one thing that I would want to change about this movie, I think the, the lead could have been played by someone who was a more, like, charismatic, for example, performer. It's just, yeah. But the, yeah. You know, what? I don't know why the 80s and 90s had so many muscular men with accents that mean that every single, like, you know, the, the yeah, just, I, I think I read that he, his, his accent is French Canadian, you know, and that does sometimes like he's he's struggling to get through he's he's struggling to say the words of the script in a way that feels natural to him but also he's not like changing around the lines too much and yeah now they his his character he's very he he's he's very self-sacrificing and he wants to you know he clearly has a moral code now, they say that he's the most highly decorated captain of the Black Berets until he lost an entire platoon. As far as I've been able to tell, there is no such thing as a Black Beret. Like, it's a hat. I think they were thinking that it sounds like a way more intense version of a Green Beret. So they just made it up, and it sounds ridiculous, and I love it, and I want more, please. And, yeah, Lauren Lachlan... I don't think I've seen her in anything, as, as Karen B. Brannick, I don't think I've seen her in anything else, but I'm, I'm going to quote a fellow critic here. Lauren Lachlan had no such experience. She wanders in a daze throughout, through the conventional plot, resembling a lost Cocker Spaniel. That's, that's, yeah, that's a really good way to put that. And then we have Kurtwood Smith as prison director Poe, and... Yeah, he's, you know, what one of the one of the other critics said, said that this is the kind of role that typically goes to a Malcolm McDowell type guy, and yeah, that's really perfectly put. His performance isn't as mo as much fun as his performance in RoboCop One, but it is really layered. Like, there's a lot to this guy. When you first see him, you just hate his guts. You don't like, but. Over the course of the film, you see more aspects of his personality, and yeah, like the the. I don't think I'm going to go into it here, but yeah. And Carolyn Purdy Gordon is the voice of Z10, the computer that. Yeah, the the and and since it's an American prison, it must be spelled Z E D. Since otherwise Z, that's that's how Canadians say the letter Z. But yeah, which I always thought made more sense because Z and C sound way too similar. But nothing else sounds like Z. And Lord Z, you know, thought he was kind of cool when I was ten years old. So I I, I like the word Z. The, the, yeah, and that pronunciation of the letter as well. Anyway, Carolyn Purdy Gordon is apparently, was apparently the, the wife of Stuart Gordon, and she gives an incredible performance. Like, the, the, she is very intimidating. And, is that... I'm not sure if that's sound. 
Huh. And anyway, it I don't think it's anything. There's anything wrong or anything. Anyway, yeah. So the the you know she's not quite like Shodan or Gladys or something, but she is very intimidating and yeah. Lincoln Kilpatrick plays Abraham. So the black man who works for the white man is named Abraham, played by Lincoln. <laughs> this movie is not subtle. I mean, I realize it's possible that, like, when they cast him, they just didn't notice. I don't know. It just... Yeah. I... Anyway. Jeffrey Combs plays D-Day, the computer geek. And... Yeah, I'm going to I'm do, going to quote a few fellow critics here. D Day, Jeffrey Combs, nabbing all the best lines. The casting of Gordon Regular Combs is a masterstroke, and he plays things wonderfully broadly as the affable geek of the piece. More fun is Jeffrey Combs doing his best burnt out Dennis Hopper impression. That's yeah. Jeffrey Combs, reanimator Castle Freak, meanwhile, is great as D Day, looking like a male version of Professor Tr Trelawney. He draws you into the film's world with his mechanical tinkerings. You really don't want him to die. I'm not telling you whether he does or doesn't. Learn a bit of Gordon Friend and staple Jeffrey Combs as the Lambert Friend, Lambert Friend and Bug-Eyed Hacker. And you have the beginnings of Schlockfest of Sublime Master. He's, he's probably the most fun performance. I wouldn't say that he's overall the most compelling of the characters, but his performance is just... Yeah, like, I was, this was my reference point for Jeffrey Combs. So when I started watching Star Trek, it was, that took some getting used to, you know, as, as a, yeah, that took some getting used to. But he's great there as well. You know, he's, he's one of the few good things about Star Trek Enterprise, you know, and he's actually... I think I I think I looked at it once. He's like old enough that he could have been in every Star Trek, but he apparently wasn't on TOS, which is too bad because they did occasionally have kids. You know the um, what's his name again? The brother of the director, Ron Howard's brother, Clint Howard. I think Clint Howard was on TOS as a kid, so. It wouldn't have been impossible even if Jeffrey Combs was just a child. And I think, if if I recall, let's see, he is... Is he on Next Gen? He's on Voyager, Deep Space Nine, and Enterprise. I forget if he's on Next Gen, though. Anyway. Vernon Wells plays Maddox, and, like... He's intense. He's very intense. You know, I, I only, the only other thing I've seen him in, I, I think, is Commando, and he's, he's good in that, but they do really undermine his character near the end of that movie, which I always thought was a, a really, sh a huge shame. But yeah, here he's, yeah, he's, he's really, really intense, and they, yeah. And... Clifton Collins Jr., credits it as Clinton Gonzalez Gonzalez, plays Nino Gomez. He explains to John about 187. He himself was apparently arrested by 21 Jump Street. He was hanging out with these Irish twins who were, like, wearing black, acting on their own moral code. You see, at the time, he had retired from his job patrolling the U.S.-Mexico border. And... Let's see. Right, one of the one of the critics says that each of the characters has an arc, which yeah, yeah, I, I think that's accurate. I that's not something I had really put words to before this viewing, but yeah, I think so. Which, you know, the 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 excellent The Suicide Squad, not, not to be confused with the 2016 mess, Suicide Squad also 
has an arc for every major character. And uh, yeah, it, you know, just goes to show you can have a really gory, like, movie with, with like, tons of violence and, like, you know, really messed up jokes and, and such and still have an arc for, you know, most, at least, of the characters. Anyway, let's see. The... Now, the... Right, so, the dialogue. Yeah, the the there's some really fun dialogue delivery in in this movie. I I don't think that. I mean, is is Jeffrey Combs capable of delivering a line in a way that's just boring? If so, I haven't seen it. Sometimes characters in this talk the way people do in real life. None of the dialogue is just white noise. It does a good job conveying characterization and delivering exposition. There are 20 entries in the IMDb quote section and I would say all of them are good. And the movie does a good job characterizing like John, Karen, and some of the prisoners, you see them in tremendously varied circumstances. We see what they're like when things are going well. We see how they respond to things going wrong. Now. There. Of, of all the aspects of the movie, the, the thing that stays with you the longest after watching is just how brutal the prison is. Now, the cinematography was handled by David Egby, who was also the director of photography on Virus. I've got to watch Virus again from 1999. I, if I find a copy of that movie, I am definitely doing a video on it. I, it's probably not quite as good as I remember it, but I really love that movie. Virus, Daylight, Dragonheart, Warlock, and Mad Max. And let's see the yeah. So quoting some fellow critics here, cinematography was provided by David Eggby, a particularly well-regarded director of photography in Australia, who has extensive work on sci-fi features such as Mad Max and Pitch Black to his name. Edler's fluid, polished cinematography and. Technically, this film is fantastic, as there are no flaws in camera use. And yeah, it's it's really well done. There are some, you know, I, I already described, quoted someone else describing the opening shot, and yeah, they it's it's really excellent. And it's it's one of those things where you know some sometimes you'll get a, a DP who's really great at like action, but not like other stuff or vice versa, he's great at both. Like, when it's an action scene, he captures the action. Like, you're never confused about the geography or choreography in an action scene. But a lot of the movie is not action. A lot of the movie is them trying to just figure out how to get through the, the various things, you know. It's, it is an action movie, but not every single scene is an action scene. And yeah, he handles those scenes really well as well. And the movie was edited by Tim Wellburn. I have not seen anything else that he's edited. But he definitely, he, he got it. He, he understood the, the how to best make it, it work. And the, the editing keeps the action moving fast without the cutting being so frenetic that you can't tell what's going on. And during scenes without action, it's much more calm and it lets things sit so they hit the audience harder. Now, the the movie has a very dystopian look, very dark and creepy. You know, it's been compared to Total Recall, Robocop 1, and Paul W. Anderson's Soldier. And Cronenberg, his look. 
and One critic says that Fortress is a film with the humor of, a sh of the Shawshank Redemption and the action of the Terminator. The movie does a really great job with the special effects. Like the uh, there's the right amount. If there were more or less, if if there were more, it would be distract. I c I could understand some people would maybe say it's a there's a little bit too much, and there are certainly. There are a few sequences where, I mean, it's probably not more than maybe one minute, maybe two minutes in a row, but, like, they'll have these effects over the, like, it, it'll mostly be, ah, let's see, what's the word? It's, it's not CG, but they'll, like, do these overlay visual effects and, like, mess with the, the video quality and such I think an argument could be made that like I, I don't know if it goes on for too long but I think it, it goes right up against the limit if it went on for longer I would be saying it goes on for too long nearly all the effects are practically done it has some incredible makeup effects prosthetics explosions death scenes and such there are very few CGI shots. They realized that it wasn't completely convincing, despite the 90s and early 2000s being a time when movies relied entirely too heavily on CGI. I am perhaps being a tiny bit charitable. Honestly, I think it's possible that part of the reason there's not that much CGI is the budget. And, yeah. So, you know, that that is the thing. I Sometimes the best creative decisions come from a limitation and let's see so quoting a fellow critic here matte paintings and miniatures which are very convincing help add scope and scale to the prison the best shots tilt up and down the vertical space that is the center axis of the underground prison lined with elevators and ventilation fans a very good model that doesn't look like one and the, the stunts are great as well. The budget was $12 million. And the box office was actually $48 million. So, you know, it was financially successful. Although critics didn't much care for it. And, yeah, quoting some fellow critics here. Props and sets that barely hold together. I'll get this out of the way first. The budget of the film isn't fantastic. Nearly all of the action takes place in the Tatua Fortress, which consists of a handful of sets used two or three times over. There is also a truly awful makeup job, a tattoo that more resembles an enthusiastic black marker. The the 187, you know, as you might know, that 187 means a person has killed someone. It's the code for murder, I, I, isn't in LA or something and yeah there's a there's a prisoner in this who has 187 on their forehead and yeah it's supposed to be a tattoo and yeah it looks like a, a marker it really yeah now the production design a number of the technologies we see feel like they could be real they're not extremely futuristic like teleportation or easily achievable space travel there are a few things that don't feel realistic, though, but I, I do think, and again, it's possible some of this was budget issue, you know, like some, some of the guns you'll see, they're essentially like, well, you know, they took a prop gun that they already had, and then they added some stuff to make it look, you know, to, to hide the fact that they just took a regular prop gun, but... It, it works. It makes the world feel more real. There, there's a there's a visceral, tactile feel to... It, it feels like the world of the movie exists in real life. And... Let's Right, and the, yeah, 
as far as costumes go, they're, the, the prisoners and the people who work in the prison had clothes that fit their situation and the, yeah, this is, this is too cool to not at all. Spoiler. There are these guards slash soldiers. They're supposed to stop prisoners from escaping and they have like armor and like helmets covered and just, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. Anyway, no more spoilers for the time being. Now, let's see, the, um, yeah, so, so the, the, you know, the action, there are chases on foot, physical fights, shooting, and, yeah, technically, the following is, yeah, spoilers, is incredibly gratifying seeing the major characters using guerrilla methods, turning their seeming weaknesses into strengths, like, Oh, you're going to put bombs in our stomachs? Fine, we can use them to blow a hole to escape. Oh, you're going to have elevator turrets to kill us? Fine, we'll use them as actual elevators. Oh, you're going to have a computer make all these cruel, heartless decisions about how inmates are treated in the prison? Fine, we'll destroy it with a virus. No more spoilers for the time being. So, the... Yeah, there's some pretty intense body horror in this. Like, if if you're not okay with body horror, yeah. Like, it, it, there, it, it could be worse. Like, I'm not saying it's not like Cronenberg's The Fly or something, but there are still some, some fairly extreme, very, very visceral and, yeah. And the, yeah, the, the villains are, and antagonists are very memorable, very creepy. And the villain slash antagonist plan makes sense, and that was the right choice. The hero's plan makes sense, and that was also the right choice. And, yeah, the movie... It's easy to follow, meant to be, and I think that was the right choice. Now, the music was handled by, excuse me. Okay, I'm going to try, but I'm going to butcher this guy's name. Frederic Talgorn. I'm going to go ahead and guess is how you pronounce that. I have not seen anything else that he has handled the music for, but yeah, it's it's like very foreboding and threatening and like you know the 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 music during action scenes is is very intense and the sound design like the various creepy things in the movie all have noises that really make them come alive which is good because intestination you know it's like like you see the people, but it's it's basically acting like they're like pretending that it really hurts, and like yeah, you're not. You, it's it's not a very visual thing other than the acting performance. But they have this like like if you're if you're sensitive to like high pitched noises, do not watch this movie because the intestination comes with this really high pitched whine. And yeah, like, I, I mean, they basically, they found a frequency that, like, it doesn't make you get up and leave the theater, but it does convey, okay, this, this hurts. And there's some black comedy, sometimes we're laughing at characters, sometimes we're laughing with them. And some of the comedy is a bit... Like, there's this one bit of 
I mean, I think it's supposed to be funny. It certainly is at least a little funny, but they it's it's kind of overdone. I, yeah, I think I'll just... Spoiler. There's this brief bit where they think that one character is basically like, okay, his brain is mush, so, you know, and then he speaks, and he's clearly normal, and, like, everyone, like, their their head pops into frame, and it's just, like, it's like they 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 had a ham off. They were trying to see who could be the hammiest in popping their head in. And it happens with characters that are normally, like, really, really very serious, not, not goofy at all. And, yeah, it's, it's really, yeah. And, and the, ah, what was the, let's see. I think that was actually when, you know, when I watched this as a, as a teenager, this was one of the few things that, you know, I talked to the other people, I, the other teenagers I showed it to, and we were like, okay, that was pretty stupid. No more spoilers for the time being. At times, the movie can be cheesy and hokey. In a lot of ways, the level of the the realism is fairly at a fairly high level. You don't need to suspend disbelief very much to get into it. The laws of physics apply. There are okay. To be fair, I wrote there are not many contrivances. When I think about it, there is. Ah, excuse me. I need to adjust how I'm sitting for my back. Yeah, there are, there are definitely some contrivances, but um, I guess yeah, when you're watching it, you maybe don't notice as much. But then when you think back to it afterwards, okay, that was pretty. The movie is an hour and 27 minutes without end credits and 91 and a half minutes with end credits. It is worth the investment of time. If you're not interested, 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. I know some people say that it feels longer than it actually is. I've never, that's never been my experience. It's not the kind of movie where you're gonna just you want to fast forward through parts or only watch very specific parts I don't really I, th I think it has the right length I don't wish it was longer or shorter now that brings us to yeah I would say the best element of the movie is how vivid the world the movie creates is the brutality the body horror the high-tech elements and I would say it's worth watching at least once just to experience those elements. And some people are going to want to own this so they can rewatch parts or even the whole movie for those aspects. Now, let's see. The, the, yeah, the worst aspect is probably how cheesy it is and you know, it'll be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing that, lowering your expectations. I don't think it's a big deal. And the worst aspect, according to others, is that it doesn't dive deep enough into the complex issues that it brings up. And, yeah, I've kind of already said that, you know, I don't think it's that big of a deal. But, yeah, again... It'll be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing it, you know, lowering your expectations so that, for, for sure, like, if, if you go into this expecting it to really dive deep into very many of all the, the issues that it brings up, you are definitely going to be frustrated and disappointed. I was, before the first time I watched this, I was most worried about Lambert's acting, and the movie has lived down to my expectations for that. The thing I was most looking forward to, once again, keeping in mind the first time I watched this, I was a jaded teenager. The thing I was looking forward to the most was the body horror, and the movie exceeded my expectations. And let's see. The, 
the movie can be draining. Like, there are a lot of really extreme things that it, you know, yeah, that it, it forces you to experience. If you sit through the entire movie and you're not, like, covering your eyes or any of it, anything. The movie doesn't leave a lot of unanswered questions, and that's a good thing. There are mostly answers to the mysteries, and that is also a good thing. I was only able to find one trailer, a two-minute, four-second one, which, you know, it's on YouTube, it was, is on the DVD, if, or at least some of the DVDs that this is, yeah. It gives away at least a little bit too much. You know, you get too much of an idea of how the escape will work out. It reveals some twists, which you really shouldn't know going into the movie, so, yeah. But, on the other hand, the trailer does give you a good idea of what the movie is like. If you like the trailer, you'll, you're likely to like the movie. If you don't, you're less likely to like the movie. The cover and poster don't give too much away, and they give you a decent idea of what it's like. So if you like the cover and or poster, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. The movie doesn't have a lot of metaphors, difficult to understand elements, there's not a lot of depth. Or a little bit of stuff to analyze. And you don't need to watch it more than once in order to understand it. And there isn't really, like, in order to fully appreciate the movie, you need a, a little bit of an understanding of what, like, a dictatorship looks like. You know, this should not be the first time that you encounter, you know, that kind of idea. But other than that, it's, you, you don't need to, you don't need other foreknowledge to understand it. The movie is way better than it has any right to be, more than you might expect it to be, and than you might have heard that it is. Like, it's it's wild how well it works. You know, the, the, the cinematography, editing, and especially directing are just really, really solid. Now, let's see. The... Hmm. The Tomato Meter, this was given a 38% based on 16 reviews and only a 40% audience score based on over 10,000 ratings. I, yeah. And the Meta Score is 48 based on 18 critic reviews, 6 positive, 8 mixed, and 4 negative. And there's no user score on Metacritic, and I don't think there were even any user reviews. So this, it's it's wild to me how few reviews I was able to find of of this. On IMDb, it has a five point nine out of ten, and only eighty two reviews. But the vast majority of the top rated ones are positive. Now there are positive ones that are not top rated. But there are almost none at the top that are negative. So overall, like the peeps, at the very least, the people rating the IMDb reviews liked the movie. You know, mo more of them liked the movie than didn't. But then, you know, a bunch of, you know, this is the kind of movie that I could see a bunch of people like maybe rented a copy or something and afterwards they were like this really wasn't that good and they go on like the most common vote on imdb is a six out of ten and I, I can understand that so that's yeah and imdb's external reviews section only had 75 links to external reviews and i was able to copy in 37 of them the rest are dead links, languages I don't speak, and that kind of thing. Now, violence and gore. Gore for the gore hounds, blood for the bloodhounds. Spoiler. There is some really excellent gore. Like, body parts are blown off. Entire bodies are blown up. Like, there's an absurd amount of blood. 
in in some of these like you know a body will explode and just blood will go everywhere like if you yeah if you like having blood and gore in movies this is definitely yeah but and and that's also why you definitely want to make sure that you try to find a version that hasn't been censored because if it's censored it loses a lot of the the kick no more spoilers for the time being right uh, something i i did not mention yet about the intestinator is that it is demonstrated as both a torture device and murder weapon very early on like there's a there's an inmate that is almost immediately first tortured and then killed by it exploding so you know it really hammers home this thing is yeah now there is some sexual material I think some people would say that there's too much you know gore in the movie and I, I could understand I I don't quite agree now hmm is the violence and gore appropriate there's definitely some of it that's not and there's some that does not serve a purpose some of it is fun because of catharsis and yeah the the There's definitely an argument to be made that this goes too far with some of what it shows. Now, the... Yeah, so... I'm not sure I have to say the following, but no, this is not capital C cinema. It's basically junk food. And... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and quote Philip Critic here. Fortress also contains some hilariously dated 90s elements. For example, at one point, Lambert is, tor Lambert is tortured in a gyrosphere. Man, there were so many movies in the early 90s that used gyrospheres as futuristic sci-fi devices just because people hadn't seen them before, like The Lawnmower Man. You'd never get away with that stuff now. I like to think that the reason that he's screaming in pain when spinning in the gyrosphere is that he's frustrated with how nonsensical it is as a torture device. Now, I wholeheartedly recommend this movie to fans of edgy 90s movies and fans of the actors. Now, my DVD has almost no special features, so, you know, if if you buy that DVD, I'm, I'm aware that there is... There's at least one Blu-ray. Actually, no, wait. No, that also didn't have any extras, did it? Now that I think about it. I read about that there is a Blu-ray, but I'm not sure that there were very many. Anyway, the reason you would buy it would be to be able to watch it at any time, which is why I bought it. And depending on the country, you can stream this on Netflix or Disney+. Plus. Now, if I had to be, like, brutally honest, like, film critic, I guess this is probably a 6 out of 10, but I don't. So I give this 8 random intestinations out of 10. And if the movie... If the acting... You know, I, I, would, be, I would be rating it higher. If the acting and the... cheapness of production were better. Now, that brings us to the start of the thoughts sections, the spoiler sections. So, thoughts section start, disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. 
I I don't really hope for s f further sequels, and I would probably be saying I I wouldn't be hoping for a sequel even if I hadn't already watched the actual sequel. You know, it's it's the kind of thing like, of course people want more, of course, because it's so much fun to watch, but. If the entire movie is them trying desperately to get out of prison and then you make another movie, like, either that movie puts them back in prison and it's like, we did this already, or they're not in prison and we're like, why is it a sequel if the prison isn't, you know, and yeah, I would like a spiritual successor to this. And maybe it exists and I just haven't watched it because once again, I haven't watched very many of these prison escape stories. You know, I, I actually, I don't know why. I think for a while, I figured that none of them are going to be as good as this. And I was like, I don't want to be disappointed. I think that's why I haven't watched very many of them. Because some of them have looked inter like interesting and entertaining. But yeah, I hope that there are movies that, you know, they don't have to be quite as extreme, quite as, like, the, the bit where they're about to kill Karen... You know, they they're, they're, they they want to cut the baby out of her stomach, but kill her. You know, that's like, come on, man. That's, at, at this point, you're just like, it's, yeah, that's kind of ridiculous. But I'm, I'm not saying it has to be as edgy. But it needs to have some edge to it. It needs to not be as bland as the second movie. And yes, I will be doing a review. With the second movie also. But it, I, th I think it's... Is that like a month away? Because we're getting into some... There's going to be like... Movies in the theaters pretty soon. That I'm going to be... And I'm also currently doing a... You know... Yeah. I don't, I don't want to get stuck in a rut. So I go back and forth between different series. Now, so, so yeah, I will pretty soon be doing a video on the Star Wars Episode 5. Now, the, let's see, what was the... Yeah, I, if, if I spoil anything other than this movie, I... You know, I will verbally warn and then, again, hold up an index finger while I give the spoiler, lower the index finger as soon as I'm done with the spoiler. So you can mute and skip ahead if you want to avoid the spoiler. So, let's see. The... Excuse me. I probably will swear at least some in this video. Now, instead of me quoting all the lines that I love from the movie, let me just say here, I loved every line that they put in the IMDb quotes section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. And yeah, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some is analysis, some is MSC3, riff tracks, and other jokes, especially jokes in the first thoughts section. Time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts that I had while watching, chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, like tweeting or like. The section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. And let's see. Um, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? I mean, certainly, let's see, that the, those would be Maddox. Ah, right on the tip of my tongue. Maddox's friend, Poe, and I guess Z10. Does she count as a character? Because, yeah, we never really have empathy for her. But, yeah, like, when Maddox is about to die... And, you know, when he looks down and he sees his stomach blown out, like, by the by the turret, yeah, you know, for, for a second there, you do 
kind of have some some empathy for him and you do get the sense that like the you know he was turned into this monster because he is a monster for sure there's no doubt about that he he tries to rape nino and then he tries to kill john when John tries to stop him from raping Nino, and, you know, he threatens Nino. Yeah. And Poe, like, when you first start watching the movie, you really don't think you'll ever have empathy for Poe, but, yeah, you know, like, he's, there, there is clearly this sense that, like, he, he misses companionship, and, like, part of why he is so cruel is that he is so lonely. Now, let me, ah, let's see, I was gonna, I was gonna say something, what was the thing that I was gonna say, let's see, right, right, I saw someone say that, you know, okay, so this, the, the Z10 can read your thoughts, but it can't figure out who the you know who started the fight i really don't think that the idea is that oh you know they just don't know who started the fight for one thing for sure it's to get that cliche you know the the guards didn't see who stopped who started the fight so you know they're all going to be you know pressured into talking but you know, I, I get that. So that's like, they're they're kind of acting like they don't have a, you know, this futuristic sci-fi. Okay, maybe there is some aspects where you can tell that it was four different writers. The writer who wrote that didn't know that someone else was going to write in that the the machine can read your thoughts. But I think also part of it is just saying that it's not a good situation. The The person who was being targeted by someone else isn't going to just say, oh, it was him, it was him, that guy, the, you know, 187, him, right over there. They're not going to do that. They're, they're too scared to do that. And, you know, the movie is pointing this out that, you know, oh, they're, oh, we're going to keep the order in this prison and, yeah, but... The moment that you're not watching them, the person who says who did it is going to get beaten up by the others. You know, I, I really don't think that it's a problem for the movie that that scene is in there, even though they also have... I, I don't think that... I mean, Z10 is not interested in solving problems. I don't think Z10 minds that it's... It's, it's sending a message. You know, because everyone knows the three of them that were involved in the fight, they have to stand there. And if they, like, if their knees get tired, well, they're going to, their skin is going to touch the, the, you know, the laser thing. It's sending a message that if you get involved in a fight, you're going to be forced to, to stand in one of these. It's not really about who did it. I'm almost certain that's the idea of the movie, at least. I could be wrong. Now, I really appreciate that the movie does try to not make Karen just this, you know, there, there are so many movies where, you know, the movie's for men, so the, they don't actually make sure that the, the, you know, the female characters, you know, so, sometimes it's because they figure women aren't going to watch it anyway. Sometimes it's because they figure, well, men don't like women that are strong. They'll they'll be threatened by that and people won't watch it. I really appreciate that the, you know, she does get to do some stuff. And, you know, it's one of those things, like, it's a movie full of masculine men doing manly things to, to escape. So, you know, is it gender stereotypical that the, like some of the only stuff the woman does is healing you know she 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 gets she she helps john out of the mind wipe but it is saying that that's something she's doing to help you know she she is a nurturer
Now, I think the movie does a good job not overexposing the threat. Like, let's see. So you have the you have intestinators, you have the the height. You know, they, they, if you fall off the retractable bridge or something, you'll you'll die from the fall. You have the the turret elevators. You have the yes the yeah that's not, that's not Z ten herself but the the little thing that that you know ah what's it called the the thing that the the camera thing I guess that you know it it's it's stuck to the ceiling but it's moving along this path and and like watching and and stuff yeah and the and then the laser bars. I think they do a good job of, like, none of them are in the movie. N n uh, none of them. Right, and, and there's, did I mention the strike clones? Uh, it's, they bear repeating. None of them are so heavily relied upon that the movie just gets boring and just, okay, we get it, intestinate, you know. Okay, we maybe, there's maybe enough intestination going on, but I'm saying, there's not so many of the blown up stomachs, you know, really there's only, come to think of it, I guess only one person has their stomach blown open. It's the claustrophobic guy. Yeah, because, yeah, Maddox doesn't get intestinated to death. He gets shot by the, the elevator turret because that's why his intestinator is lying there afterwards. I do, I do quite like the bit with, you know, Z10 just says, you know, Poe is, is hearing it and Z10 says, okay, we're intestinating this, 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 and this person. And he's like, Maddox, no, Maddox is dead, you know, because Z10 is just going off of, well, I can scan Maddox's intestinator, so he must still be alive. And just, yeah. Now... And I don't know, maybe it's just me. To me, the violence never got numbing. And the... I mean, the sex is kind of gratuitous, let's be honest. It's it's there to be... Yeah, you know, it's, it's so that the MPAA can say, Oh, it has sex. And put that on the, on the thing so that when you go and rent and you're like flipping through, you know... And and you look at the oh, it has sex. We're renting this one. You know that's that's the basic idea. It's it really didn't need to be there, but you know it does like it communicates that John spends a lot of time thinking about sex with you know he dreams about it. He you know the the mind wipe also has those images. And, yeah. Now. My making jokes in this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad, or me wanting to make light of the subject. I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and overanalyze everything I watch. Now, that brings us to the very next section, entitled Notes Taken Before Watching while watching wow i've been recently i feel like i've been scrolling that up a lot anyway notes taken while watching you immediately get a sense that karen and john love each other and are willing to sacrifice a lot for each other she says that she'll make the trip alone but he refuses he insists on being there to protect her the cop makes a sexist joke and seems really personable but he has no sympathy for what he calls breeders people who have more than one child even the nicest and most personable people who work for this fascist state show no empathy for breeders. And it's such a great, like, you know, he's, he's standing there checking the, the luggage, and then this other woman goes through and, you know, gets scanned, and it reveals that she's pregnant. And the... Yeah, he, you know, and, and then afterward, he notes that the the what's it called the corner of the flak jacket is is sticking out it it prevents scanning for you know or it yeah it blocks for the scanning really brutal 
with the dogs tearing skin off John. A couple of checks bounced, and he goes to maximum security. That really is just, yeah. I got 31 years. Then why the fuck are you smiling? And John didn't want to give up his wedding ring. And even when they see that that's all it is, they still force him to throw it away. And the guy has claustrophobia. He's terrified of going down the prison. He has a note from his doctor, but they're not listening. And the movie immediately demonstrates the yellow line, red line rules were not an exaggeration. They will be enforced no matter the circumstance. They, it's, it's really... It's... it's well thought out of you know of the movie to do i mean i mean it's essentially you know if it wasn't futuristic it would it, it would be that he was the 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 fish that broke down the the quickest yeah you know. it's so weird for me to see baby-faced clifton collins jr like Everything that I'm used to seeing him in is from the early to mid 2000s. So some of it is 10 years after this movie came out. I remembered his character, but the last time I watched this movie, I wasn't familiar with the actor from anything else. They cross the bridge and immediately it withdraws, so it will be extremely difficult to get back. And at first they're saying there's no more room in the cell, but the threat of intestination gets them to remember. To gets them to relent I think it's supposed to say there's all kinds of time think about it you know if you heard that line completely out of context not knowing that it's a prisoner doing hard time you might think that's really deep like abstract or possibly some something someone thought of while high both Maddox is just such a cheery guy he's always got a chuckle Maddox's friend rather yeah we do not observe for personal pleasure. If there's one thing I've learned about people in high authority is that they're all hypocrites. Holy crap, Vernon Wells is intense. Let's see. Honestly, I don't know what I would do if he left. I guess I probably shouldn't say that while he can clearly hear me. It is legitimately touching when the black inmate is talking about her baby and her and Karen fighting to prevent the doctors from taking it. And again, I, I think the movie is trying to say, like, isn't it sick that we put pregnant women in prison? And that is a thing. There are, you know, like the... I forget what decade it was, but some decades back, there were so many you know, mothers of very small children in prison that, let's see, I want to say they were called Fitz and Bowlby, were able to do a psychological study. And they didn't even, like, as far as I understand, they didn't remove the, they didn't separate the kids from the, the mothers. They just wrote down what happened when the when the prison system did that. You know, I, I really, look, I get it. I'm not saying that if you're pregnant, it is impossible to, to break the law or something. But I do think we got to be reasonable. Like, it's just, it's not right to, to treat someone pregnant like that. Let's see. Now, the, the, yeah, I like seeing John and Nino fighting Maddox. I'm sure the movie would have been great with Arnie as well in the role of John, but it is really cool to see someone as big as Warren and Wells fight someone as small, comparatively, as Christopher Lambert. Like, Arnie and Vernon Wells are both big. I'm, I, couldn't offense i mean arnie is bigger right certainly the the like biceps and such are big anyway retract the bridge god i can't wait for someone to wipe that smile off his face and poe tells john to execute maddox it's just wow 
and so tense and scary as the retracting bridge goes more and more in. Thankfully, it stops before the two are pushed off. You know, like, again, the first time I watched it, I was like, they're going to die. They're going to fall off and they're going to die. And then it stops and there's just enough room. And, you know, even though John isn't willing to kill Maddox, Poe does it with the... Ah, what's it called? Was it the elevator turret? It's it's a turret, at least. So cool when he looks down and he sees this massive hole in his own chest. And Zed was going to kill John as well, but... What's, what does that say? Yeah, Poe changes it to random intestination. And John picks up the intestinator and hands it to Nino since he's being taken away himself. And we see the mind wipe. The snakes in the crib are really disturbing. And then, you know, Maddox is raping Karen. And there's a what are they called baby in a jar like like little fetus in a jar with poe and john imagines ripping his own eyes out I, I guess he just watched the sequel mother of god what have they done to him they showed him every single highlander sequel they made him binge them you don't eat you don't sleep oh he's a world of warcraft addict you can't make love, can you? Yep, definitely a World of Warcraft addict. I saw one reviewer question why Poe has champagne if he doesn't drink. I'm almost certain he got it for her. He's trying to do things for her. In some way, he probably does love her. But it's a, it's a very toxic way. Like, he's willing to torture her to, to get John to, to, you know, yeah, to go along. So clearly it's not it's not a healthy kind of self-sacrificing love. Now that John is completely wasted from the mind wipe, they visualize it by him being a small child down this hole in the earth, and Karen helps him out of there, which, you know, yeah, the movie's not subtle. The movie is not subtle. But it's a good visualization. It it gets across. And I mean that is essentially like you know, he is down a hole in, in the earth and, you know, he feels like, uh, like mentally he's regressed to a child, I, I guess is what there's, or he feels like a child. It's, it's something like that. Somebody wake up, Brannick. I'm awake. So the words he said were, I'm awake, but apparently what the others heard were, I will pay you a million dollars each if you deliver the most over top of the reaction to me no longer being mind wiped. Like, if you if you haven't watched for a while, watch that bit. It's it's ridiculous. Like they all stick their heads into the the frame from like it's 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 the goofiest thing. Just it's ridiculous. Abraham Lincoln tells Karen about John's state and escape plan and. That, of course, does lead to, yeah. I don't know for sure if it's the material or Jeffrey Combs' delivery of it. Okay, I think, you know, for sure part of it is, is part of it is his delivery. But him admitting that the reason he ended up in prison is that he blew up the money when trying to rob a bank just cracks me up. And I really like that he phrases it, I blew up the, the vault like butter. Who blows up butter? I mean, I think he means it was like a hot knife through butter, butter, or I blew it up really easily, but just, yeah. And Poe forcibly opens Karen's hand, not, not because he thinks there's anything in there, just, what is he, like, kiss it or something? For a second, we think he's going to find the diamond, but then we see she stuck it in her mouth when she pretended to yawn, very clever, and 
I mean, the actress must really have done that because they didn't cut. Like, we see her with the, it in her hand and she looks away and, and hides, you know, puts her hand down. And then when she, you know, she yawns and then, you know, it's, it's a good thing he doesn't ask for, like, a very detailed. I don't know. I don't know what I'm hungry for tonight, Karen. But what, what, what would you like? Just be as descriptive as possible. <laughs> that would be kind of, I hope, I wish there was an outtake of that. That would be really, really funny though. But just, you know, she yawns and then I, I forget what he says, but he says something and she responds, <laughs> you know, just trying not to, to be too obvious about the thing in there. I could listen to Jeffrey Combs explain intestinators for hours. I think I'm starting to sound like I have a crush on him. I don't have a crush on him. It's like TNT on PMS. No, wait, it's like nitrogen on PMS. That's a way better line. Let's Yeah, the the I forget exactly what Karen's line is, but you know she she says something, and then you know Abram responds, "Fuck the dumb shit. That's a pretty big all." Uh, yeah, Karen, the word "all" is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. If you won't do this for me, do it for my baby. And it cuts to his hand opening, revealing the gem back in the cell. Very nice cut. We don't need to see him agree and take it and walk back. It just, you know, that was the, and they put the gem in Jeffrey Combs' glass, D-Day, D-Day's glasses, and then they can see the entire plan over the prison. Very clever, kind of. And he drops the glasses because the laser is, like, he's, you know, okay, he's not holding it between his fingers, but it, he's still, his hand is not very far away from the laser. And, you know, Brennick, like, really struggles to reach it out. The, and he just, get, and, and he does, get, you know, get, get singed, but he does get it back. And you see the, the Z10 camera slowly moving. Back. Like, you know, when, when that thing, when you don't want that thing near you, it feels like it's moving, like, it's, you know, moving through molasses. It's just the slowest. And then suddenly it's like, oh, don't, you better, you better stop touching the laser. And Abraham struggles to put the gem back and he does manage to put it back right before Poe activates it, but it's not back in perfect place. I, I really appreciate that bit. Like when you, the first time you watch the movie, you're like, oh, don't, Stop. Just let it go. Let it go. Oh, thank goodness. He did that. And you, you don't think that Poe is going to realize that it was, you know, and, you know, Poe is angry and Abraham takes the fall instead of him getting angry at Karen. I'm telling you, I will not enhance your child. Does this mean nothing? Hopeless romantic. Karen has to tell the man yes or no tomorrow night. We leave tomorrow morning. Am I the only one who... Um, I'm the only one who thinks of the original Prince of Persia from, like, what was it, 1989 or something? Like, you know, okay, you have an, you have an hour of, of... This would make a really good video game, by the way. I... That would... That would... Yeah. Anyway... We see them pull one out of Maddox's friend, and then Abraham agrees, you know, he's like, I'm going to go the escape on with you. John says he doesn't want to be responsible for another life ever again. And, yeah, and then we get a cut, and then we see they removed all of the, you know, yeah, all of the intestinators. There's no reason to show us every single time that it gets, now we know how it works. And... Poe is trying to give John a full pardon, but Zed shows Karen grabbing the gem. And and you know, she's like, You're you are forbidden. You're you're, you're ah, what's it called? 
Your replacement will arrive within 24 hours. You are confined to quarters until then. And he's like, I've never left these quarters my entire life. You know, just, I really appreciate the vulnerability of Poe. He could so easily have been completely one note. And they actually, because he is one of these perfect enhanced, you know, beings, the movie really is showing this would never work. Like, if you made a bunch of perfect little clone babies that, you know, they're enhanced, so they're not going to waste natural resources and such, they're going to be lonely AF. Like, there is... If, yeah, the, the movie really does a good job of picking apart all the problems with the... Yeah. And they place all the intestinators on the pipe so they can blow a hole in it. Really clever. No, Maddox is dead! Activate the strike clones. So cool. And they have to outrun the steam. And Maddox's friend tries to leave but gets perforated by one of the strike clones. I love Abraham's laugh when he reels. He reveals he can't be intestinated, but then, you know, turns out that Poe is extremely strong, and, you know, like, the, let's, let's see, yeah, you know, Karen stabs him in the back, which is a good metaphor, yeah, only to realize he's royalty, blue blood. Holy crap, the strike clones are badass. The, f the face of the strike clone is so creepy. This, like, can't, yeah. And and the, the armor, the helmets, and the big guns with the three uh, bar barrels. Just, yeah. I realize that a lot of the strike clones just get gunned down by John. But I never stop considering them really cool and badass because of the intro they get. And just as the elevator turret is going to blow up D-Day... John tackles him, and instead the strike clone that was about to shoot him gets blown up. Tell them to stop now. Before the camera goes in for an even closer close-up, I'm counting pores and sweat beads here. And D-Day says if they can just get him to the keyboard, he can get them out of there. It is such a clever, like, you know, the, their basic... You know, Zed says we're not gonna, we don't, what was it, we don't inter, no, not interrogate. Ah, it's right on the tip of my tongue. We don't, let's see, it's not interrogate. Ah. I guess I just don't... Anyway. You know, with, with hostage situations. And then they blow up Poe. And you see, like, the skull and all the blue blood. Just... Yeah. I have to imagine that gun hurts to use. Because Christopher Lambert cannot fire a single shot without shouting while doing it. And it's so weird. Because for so much of the movie... So much of the rest of the movie, he doesn't... Like, he, he's, he's kind of low energy, you know, so, yeah. Really cool when Zed is completely messed up, all the doors and strike clones are malfunctioning. And, you know, the some of the prisoners jump for the retractable bridge, and one of them, he, he like, he just hits it, but the, he doesn't get a good hold of the edge of the bridge, and he falls off. Holy crap. And some of the cons are trapped in an elevator. And yeah, John Karen and Nino manage to drive out in the truck. I'll be right back. I'm just going to go look for a blanket. Maybe there's one in the ADR booth. It doesn't even look like the actor originally said something. It looks like the character just wandered off because the script needed him to, and then when they were editing it, they were like, we have to have him say something. It doesn't make any sense for him to just walk off like that. 
what the hell is Nino's thought process when, like, you know, the, the truck is being kind of intimidating and he just goes up close and then just stands there looking at it. It seems like there's something wrong with it. It's appearing very threatening. Maybe if I stand right in front of it, it'll go back to normal. Like, just, but it is really epic seeing him get, you know, run over like that. And, you know, at first, John is, like, shooting it with the, the machine gun. And, let's see, he run, I think he runs out of ammo. And then he, like, hits the thing. And then he activates the flamethrower and, you know, sets it on fire and it explodes. And, you know, it does take the barn with it. Thankfully, the baby was barn, born, not, yeah, safely close by, which also means that the kid isn't going to be raised in a barn. Brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. But yeah, those strike clones are so cool. Creepy, body horror, futuristic machine guns, cyborgs com combining clones and robotics. I saw one critic call them cyber zombie. That's really cool. And, and at least one person, maybe this is how it's supposed to be spelled. He, he spelled it like strike clone as, you know, basically one word, like S-T-R-I and then the word clone. It is ridiculous that Karen manages to get out of the farm before the truck hits it. She was still giving birth last we saw, so she must have gotten up and run right after, which is just not something the human body can do like that is that is an extremely optimistic view of what like <laughs> it's it's just absurd and the movie doesn't even like like he doesn't even say how did you get no the movie just plays it straight and just pretends like that's something that could happen let's of course, it wouldn't be a 90s movie featuring computers if there wasn't a quirky hacker character, a scene where they figure out the password, and it's always something obvious. For some reason, there's always something obvious. And an improbable virus that's super effective. Where did it even come from? Because it's named after, like, it says D-Day's bring down the house virus or something like that, you know? It's like, how did he put, we didn't see like a USB stick or a floppy disk or disk drive or anything it's like where did that come from? It's just <laughs> oh i know i know he put it on the gem before abraham put it back on i think they do a good job making poe creepy but the fact that like it kind of feels like the fact that he can't have sex is saying that there's something inherently wrong with people who don't have sex. There's nothing wrong with being asexual, but, you know, sadly there were a lot of... Yeah, sadly, it's still... There's still a lot of bigotry against it. Let's see. I think that might be all of my notes. Yeah, that was everything. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video if you watch on screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and or sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which is currently What If?, and currently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my next video. Catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.